So I'm going to spend a minute. It's really a pleasure to be able to, to introduce our speaker this evening. Um, I really try to keep these things short. There, there's just so much to say about our speaker, Gerard Holtzman. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll cut down a few things, but realize there's a lot more. First of all, what's he currently doing? He's currently the founder and researcher at his firm, Nimble Research. He's also a visiting associate faculty member in computer science at Caltech. And prior to that, prior to uh, January, he spent a number of years from 2003 on as a senior research scientist at NASA JPL lab. Um, and he did a number of things there, but uh, a couple of things I want to mention. He was the founder and chief scientist of the Laboratory uh, for Reliable Software, which I think you'll hear a bit about today. And he was a flight software team member on the Mars Science Laboratory mission. So those are pretty cool things. And, and prior to that, he was at Bell Labs as a researcher from 1980 to 2003. And he did his education, his, uh, all three degrees, bachelor's, master's, and doctorate at Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. He has a, a, a wide variety of areas of professional interest, including software reliability and safety, static source code analysis, code review, formal verification, concurrency, distributed systems, logic model checking, software engineering, and software tools. And on the su subject of software tools, he's actually implemented a number of tools throughout his career, a few of which I'm going to mention here. Uh, he's designed and built software for image editing, for logic model checking, for static code analysis, and for peer code review, amongst others. He's also very widely published. He's authored and published, by my count, more than 150 papers and articles um, in a variety of both refereed and journals and conference proceedings and, and other publications. He's the inventor of eight U.S. patents uh, and uh, has given numerous university research lab and conference talks and also, I think, served on many conference uh, committees. And he has quite a few awards to his name as well, quite a few recognitions. These are just a few of them. He's a fellow of the ACM. He's a member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering. He is a recipient of the ACM System Software Award and the ACM SIGSOFT Outstanding Research Award and the R&D Council of New Jersey Thomas Alva Edison Patent Award. He is a co-recipient of the ACM Knilakis Theory and Practice Award. He has been recognized with an honorary doctorate by Twente University. He has received the NASA Exceptional Engineering Achievement Medal and the IEEE Harlan D. Mills Award. So we have a, a very um, well-recognized speaker tonight. It's a pleasure for me to introduce Gerard Holtzman. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. OK, thank you. Um, most of us are interested in software. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't be here. And not so much in hardware. And so my talk will be about software development for applications where the reliability of that software is kind of critical. Now, uh, I'll, I'll add that in some cases, um, the hardware is kind of cool. Right? So this is one of those applications where the hardware is really an excuse for taking software to another planet. And you know, there's no other way to land software on a planet and execute it there. So you need the hardware around it. But that, that kind of thing makes the whole um, application very, very cool. So here you see a landing sequence from the Mars Science Lab uh, rover holding the Curiosity rover landing on Mars. Uh, JPL is one of the few places that has successfully executed these landings uh, many times over. Uh, very, very difficult to do. So um, just, just to illustrate a little what the challenge is, um, Mars and Earth both orbit around the sun. Once every roughly two years, they come close enough together that um, it, it is attractive to try to, to make the trip. The distance is, is shorter than it is otherwise. 
but the trip takes, uh, even in, in the best case, about nine months, depending on you know, how fast you travel, et cetera. But with current technology, it's about nine months. So um, um, this particular mission was launched. There's probably a pointer here somewhere, right? Uh, oh, is it? Oh, yes. So, wow. Um, was launched in November 2011, uh, landed roughly nine months later on Mars. But meanwhile, um, both Mars and, and Earth travel around the sun. So basically, the spacecraft was on a trajectory where it falls around the sun and hopefully lands at the spot that you intended um, nine months later. So that, that happened in August 2012. Uh, the mechanics of this, calculating the trajectory, is an art in itself, a science in itself. So the two spheres rotating in space, orbiting uh, another object, the sun, uh, and you would like to land in a very precise spot at the bottom of a hill of Mount Sharp. The people who do the navigation at JPL are incredibly good, and they, they land with incredible precisions with just a few course corrections along the way. And you can imagine there are a lot of disturbances in the atmosphere on Earth on launch and the atmosphere uh, at Mars when you land, which is completely unpredictable. So uh, that's the challenge. It's a trip of about 350 million miles. And so the software is developed by a team of, of uh, developers. And you can imagine uh, this software really is executed um, only once uh, in the real application environment. Right? There's no real testing you can do in that environment. You can get there. There's a lot of unknowns when you get there. And it has to execute flawlessly the first time it executes in the real uh, environment as an application. And by the way, there are millions of people watching over your shoulder as that, ex that, that first execution happens. So no pressure there. Uh, so here is some, some newspaper articles. And the, the event of the actual landing, uh, you, you may remember, like people sitting in Times Square looking at the big uh, screens to see you know, if somebody screwed up the software. <laughs> Very happily, that didn't happen. Uh, so we had a successful launch. So this is an image taken just after the landing. And the, the, the nice thing here is that you see these blast marks. So there are the two blast marks from the, the landing uh, thrusters. So the, this is the landing system. And I'll show it in, in a little video a little bit better, uh, a, a simulation in a second. So you see the blast marks there and the rocks you know, on the deck of the rover. Uh, lots of instruments there just after the rover had landed, taken with the camera on top of the mast, which unfolded, et cetera. Um, by the way, it's not a small thing. So it's basically a small truck that, that is uh, sent to Mars. This is the back shield. So in the, the, the launch vehicle, um, this thing has to fit. So it's an enormous uh, 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 rocket that is sent into space. Um, the mass of, of the rover that was sent and that was landed there with, with the, the known technology is at the upper edge of what we know how to land safely. So that, that's uh, uh, probably the car of a JPLer that, that you know, um, sacrificed his car for uh, taking the risk that uh, this thing would, would not hold up. Um, so uh, let me sh try to show. Um, can you show the, the video or, yes. So this is like a one and a half minute uh, showing the landing sequence. We should have to around Now is it in the control room? You see all these people with the blue shirts. Um, there's a roughly 15 minute delay. Uh, transmission delay. Feature uh, light time transmission on the ground. We're down to 90, 90 seconds. So, seconds. Now, 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 to the point five point five see all these serious control panels, they can do absolutely nothing, right? Because standing at the standing moment, separation, separation. The, the telemetry comes in and has already happened 15 minutes earlier. We are in we are hard flight. <laughs> the person who is standing up and walking now, around nervously, this guy at the, at the front, is the guy who designed the landing system, this high crane mechanism. 
first time ever that that has tried. Strong, strong, strong. So there's a lot going on there, right? In, in, but it's all software driven. There's, there's the computer, the computers are in the rover. Uh, and you can, can imagine the difficulty of you have the, the, the landing stage lowering the rover onto the surface, controlled by the computer, and then the bridle has to be cut. And the, this, this landing at uh, this descent stage has to fly away. Hopefully not drop straight on top of the rover, but fly away and crash somewhere else. So there's a, a lot going on. Now, so how do you make sure it works? First, there's the hardware. And you know, I could say, we don't care about the hardware. We care about the software. Show us the real stuff, the software. But there's a lot. So this, again, showing the size of this rover. Um, at at uh, the, the back here, this is the back of the rover. You see this big uh, thing sitting there. That's the RTG that powers the rover. So there is no solar panels on, on this rover. It, it uh, uses uh, plutonium pellets, uh, the DK uh, creating heat and uh, powering this system. So this is in a huge vacuum chamber at JPL where uh, they do all this testing, exposing it to the conditions of space, like heating it from one side, freezing it from the other side, uh, doing vibration testing. So there's a facility at JPL called the Shake and Bake facility where you, know, you, you do the vibration testing and um, heating it up and making sure that all the el electronics still works uh, after all that. But, um, and there are, I'll, I'll show you this overview of all the types of testing that are being done. So there's um, different levels of fidelity for uh, increasing command and response fidelity and increasing uh, uh, flight dynamics uh, fidelity. And there are all these different things that uh, are being done, different kinds of test beds and different types of, of uh, evaluation methodologies. Most of the, the uh, flight dynamics uh, verification was done at NASA Ames. Um, uh, all of the software development further was done at uh, JPL, uh, except for instruments. So there was lots of instruments on board, lasers and cameras, and et cetera. Um, those were done by uh, contractors working with JPL. So there are the, the various stages of doing uh, the, the software fidelity. First, so GNC is guidance and, and navigation uh, algorithms and software. The flight software itself, uh, which is the, the control software for the rover that uh, manages that, that everything that the rover can drive, that, that it can land safely, et cetera. And then so there are various stages of testing. Most of the flight software testing was done in what's called WISTAS, which is the workstation test system which is a, um, a system with continuous integration. Every night there was a build, and uh, every day um, all the software developers had the full uh, system available for, for uh, building new features and adding to it, which is then get integrated the same day. And then uh, at the end, there's um, uh, at load testing, which is assembly test and launch operations which is with hardware in the loop testing. So different levels of fidelity up to bit level uh, fidelity and lots and lots and lots of simulations on large clusters of computers, basically 24 hours a day, seven days a week, weeks on end, for months on end, uh, testing every, especially the landing sequence, every possible scenario and every possible thing that might go wrong during a landing sequence. Uh, after all these simulations had been done, when the actual landing happened, it, it turned out to be one of the more perfect landing sequences then had been exercised with all the simulations, which is exactly how you would like these things to go. But okay, what about the software? So it's about three million lines of code, um, developed by, uh, it, executing in, in about 120 parallel threads of operation running on their VX works, a real-time operating system. So there's concurrency, right? There, there's concurrency, it's a priority-driven system, but 120 parallel threads, uh, with each thread having a, a separate responsibility. So that, that could be something taking care of telemetry, of the file system, of, of the cameras, imaging, compression, uh, etc. Two CPUs, one is a spare, often devices and instruments are duplicated for reliability. Um, 
originally it was not the plan to use both CPUs simultaneously. Uh, later, uh, that decision was changed to have one CPU act as a backup during the landing at least, so that if something would dramatically go wrong, a CPU would fail, have a har hardware failure, you could switch over to the other CPU, and we were careful enough to make sure that the software running on that second CPU was different from the one running on the main CPU, so that you don't you know, step on exactly the same failure. Um, five years of development time, roughly, starting from the previous mission to Mars, with a team of roughly 40 software uh, developers. Uh, I say roughly because it was not the same number throughout the development cycle. It ramped up and then it ramped down. And um, you can say roughly uh, 40 on average. So if you multiply these numbers and divide, you come out to about seven lines of code per hour. Now, any one of us can write more than seven lines of code an hour. But you know, all, the, all these lines of code have to be tested, have to be documented. There are requirements. Um, there, are, there are reviews, uh, the code reviews, requirement reviews, design reviews. Put it all together, then you come down to a, a, a rate like that, which is still a fairly respectable rate. And one customer, one use. So it, it's tempting to make the comparison with large software companies like Oracle or Microsoft or, or things like that. And, and the difference, as for instance, with Microsoft is Microsoft has millions of customers. They can try out something on you know, a small subset of a few million customers. And if something, or Google, right, if, if it doesn't really work right, they, they immediately fix and, and uh, uh, relaunch. In this case, one customer, one use, it has to work the first time it's used. So that, that puts some pressure on the developers, which from my perspective was great because I try to push techniques to improve software reliability, and often this is a hard sell. You say, you know, if you take a little bit more time and are a little more careful in how you check things and how you write things, very easy uh, a developer will say, yeah, 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 that's nice, but we don't have time for that. Not in this case, right? Because you don't want to see your name on the front page of the New York Times like, this is the guy that wrote the line of code that cost us $2 billion. So very different environment, very good for, for really uh, uh, pioneering uh, software quality uh, improvement techniques. So how did we do that? How, how do you get it right? We did a number of things differently for this mission compared to the, the earlier missions. I joined JPL in 2003. Uh, JPL uh, and NASA had just lost two missions, uh, missions to Mars, uh, Mars Climate Orbiter and Mars Polar Lander, because of software failures. Software failures happen on just about every mission. Uh, they're not always fatal, they're, they're usually not fatal, but you know, in the cases where they are fatal, they become known. So the, the, there was a lot of, of um, sensitivity to software issues at JPL, which again was great for me because it meant we could do a lot, we could achieve uh, a lot. So, we did a, a number of things differently from previous missions. First thing we did was to introduce a new coding standard. Up to that point at JPL, every mission would start by defining their own coding standard. And typically that meant that the cognizant engineer, the lead software developer who, who built his team, would define a coding standard that nobody would read and that would never be checked. So completely you know, ineffectual. So we decided that that was a silly way to do things, that we needed a coding standard that was based on risk and not on, you know, cosmetics, like, you know, where do you put your spaces and your round braces and do you put your curly braces on the same line as the if or on the next line? That's, of course, none of that is risk-related. So we, we, we developed a risk-related coding standard where we could say, if you break this rule, I can point to a mission that we lost because somebody else broke that rule too. And that's a great motivator, right? That really helps uh, uh, bring things into focus. With, with tool-based compliance checks, so there's not a single rule in that standard, and I'll show you a little bit more from that standard in a second. There's not a single in, rule in that standard that we cannot check mechanically every night. When developer checks in the code, into the code trace, they commits their code, we run the checks, and if they violate one of these rules, that shows up the next day and it shows up in the code reviews. Second thing we did was to, to uh, start a software developer certification program. Up to that point, again, you know, with taking with a, a little grain of salt, 
somebody could walk in the door after a five-week course in C programming and it would be put on a flight server team. Not, not really, but you know, in effect, it, it seemed that, like it was like that. So we said, well, that's silly. If somebody wants to touch the hardware of a, a flight system like this, he has to go through a lot of training. He understands electrostatic charges and, and all that stuff. And we, we nearly needed something like that for software as well. Like you cannot touch flight software unless you've passed this certification course. So we introduced a certification course, and that picture is on for, from the first group of flight software developers that uh, obtained their certification. So when, when a certification is issued, like the executive director will sign that certificate and, and the people teaching the course. Um, so by now, all flight software developers have, have passed that course. N not all of them passed the course, but the ones that are allowed to write software, flight software, uh, have passed the course and have their certificate. We introduced routine use of strong static source code analysis tools. Uh, so we did an evaluation of all the available tools at the time, uh, tried them out on flight software, which has a particular structure and particular idioms are used, and we, we figured out which worked the best, gave us the best bang for the buck. Um, usually not wise to restrict to a single tool. Um, there are lots of studies that have been done that show which combination of tools works the most effectively for, for security-related issues, which we don't have a lot for with systems running on Mars. Uh, but also with just uh, uh, correctness issues. Um, right. That, that there's more I can say on the security issues, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to stay on schedule. Um, then we defined a new code review process, which takes the results of the static source code analysis, which happens every single night on every build, on all the results, that uses um, the results of the tools uh, at the same level as the results of a peer code review. So there are human peer code reviewers, uh, and, and the tools run every night to do their standard checks for, for common types of mistakes that, that software developers, C software developers make. Software is written in C. Um, so that also means that it frees the peer code reviewers from checking that kind of stuff, right? the, the, the basic stuff, like uh, you know, are you forgetting to write an assertion here, and is this safe, and et cetera. So integrated with the static analysis, then we made use of formal analysis to uh, verify the correctness of key subsystems of the rover. So there are certain parts of the rover software are more critical than other parts, and so we focused on those things with, with a formal approach using uh, logic model checking, and I'll, I'll show a little bit of that as well. So first, the coding standard. So it's a JPL document, which is publicly available a little bit about how we went about uh, to create that document. So first is, is the awareness that most of these uh, coding standards have hundreds and hundreds of rules and almost none of them relate to risk. So they all sort of have these, these, this feeling of cosmetics and uh, it, which you, know, you can reformat the code in any style that you want. So there's really no need to prescribe a particular uh, format. Uh, like regulating the use of white space is really not a good use of your time. So uh, started an inventory of all flight software uh, anomalies that had been observed since the, the, the first missions that we started flying with flight software, meaning the late 60s. Uh, categorizing them, so binning them into different groups, and then you, you come out with surprisingly few uh, categories. There's only about five different categories. So you could say, well, you know, most of these anomalies can be binned in one of these five categories. If we can do something about those five categories, we're ahead of the game. So that's exactly what we tried to do. So then um, I asked a number of people that I respect in, in, flight, in software development, um, if you could only choose 10 rules, no more than 10, just 10 rules, which 10 rules would you pick? But so in return for just having 10 rules, you get the guarantee that those 10 rules will be followed. So there's no, like, oh, we're not looking, and oh, you didn't know that that was a rule. No, we make those 10 rules, and we develop checkers that can verify compliance with those 10 rules. Which 10 rules? So not like 500 rules, but just 10 rules, and they better be important. 
So we did that, and, and that led to this column that I wrote called The Power of Ten, which, which created a lot of responses. It appeared in, in uh, IEEE software or IEEE computer. Uh, and, and most responses were of the type, oh, this is great, I love it, I, I love all these rules, except one. And then they would pick a different rule every time. Uh, one response was, was the best, where it says, you really need only one rule, and it is, don't you see? Uh, <laughs> uh, so um, then we compared with leading edge standards for safety critical software development, for instance, for automobiles, we also looked at standards for medical device software. But uh, the Mishra C standards or guidelines are well known and are followed by most uh, uh, developers of automotive software, to con uh, engine control software, etc. So um, we checked uh, with peers uh, for their opinion, like, okay, which, which are really important, which rules are not that important. And we came up with a very concise set of rules for the JPL coding standard. There are only 31 rules at the first uh, four levels. So first, what we did is to introduce levels of compliance. It's not all or nothing. Not all software is equally important. Um, software, so as software becomes increasingly important, we expect compliance with a higher level of compliance, and we introduce six levels of compliance. These are the first four levels of compliance. So there are two rules for level one. All software written at JPL, no matter what it's for, should comply with level one. So it's just language compliance, like don't go outside the language because you happen to know something about the compiler that you're using. No, it has to be language compliant and therefore portable. You can compile with any compiler. There are only two rules uh, at that level. And, and so it may surprise you that the flight software for the Mars Science Lab, for the Curiosity Rover, the, all three million lines of code are portable. So they can be compiled with any compiler. Of course, we compile for a particular hardware, which is PowerPC hardware, uh, RAD 750 uh, uh, PowerPC um, hardware. But we can also compile with GCC or, or, or CLang or anything else. Level two is to secure predictable execution. There are 10 rules at that level. Level three is defensive coding, that's the, the normal uh, type of, of thing. Like, don't assume that things will always go right. And if something goes wrong somewhere else in the code, you may get very strange calls on your code, on your module. And you better be prepared to handle that. And level four is code clarity. Now, uh, for the Mars Science Lab mission, the mission com committed to uh, compliance at level four, and they did. They achieved that, which is no small matter, right? So there are only 31 rules, but it, it took quite a bit of time, took about two years to get to that level, to get full compliance at that level. There are two extra levels that, that are held in reserve for when the software is human rated. So if, if it's that safety critical that somebody can die, then we expect like full compliance with the Mishra C guidelines, like similar to automotive software in, in your car, like, you know, in some sense, your life is in the hands of the, the, the car maker. Um, so uh, I'll give three small examples of these rules just to illustrate what kind of things they are. So rule one, rule one is very, very simple. You must be able to compile your code without warnings, without getting a warning from the compiler. Not just any compiler, the latest version of GCC. So it has to be portable too. Don't go outside the language definition. Uh, and you must compile your code without warnings. And by the way, with all warnings turned on, and by the way, in pedantic mode, right? Not, not simple. Had never been done at JPL. None of the previous missions had done that. That means that when you build uh, code for these other missions, you're blown away with thousands and thousands of warnings, especially when you get into the millions of lines of code. So the, MS the MSL software, compiles with zero warnings. And so this is the chart that shows how long it took to get to that point. So um, you see um, there are three lines there. One is the line for uh, just compiling with GCC. One with uh, GCC strict, which means all warnings turned on and in pedantic mode. And one for uh, warnings of a static analyzer, covariety. And they're all sort of descending to uh, 
zero. So at this point in October 2010, uh, we had zero warnings here at the, at the end, so the, the, the red line, the red and the blue lines, with zero warnings in pedantic uh, mode from uh, GCC. And then Coverity was still uh, descending the number of warnings. So uh, 0.7 uh, static analyzer warnings per 1,000 lines of code. Uh, no previous mission had, any, uh, had gotten close to that by a very long shot. And, and of course, at that point, at that point, when you have zero warnings, you, you map warnings to errors. That means that if you now introduce a new warning by modifying the code or adding a feature, it stops the build. It breaks the build. And there are severe consequences for breaking the build. And so every company has a different role. Uh, I believe SpaceX puts a, a large uh, life-size cutout of Justin Bieber in your cubicle if you break the build. <laughs> we, were, we didn't really want to go that far. Uh, Lockheed, it is, you get a poster of Britney Spears on your wall. Uh, in our case, you got a lol, lolcat poster uh, on your wall. And some people deviously started collecting these lolcat uh, posters because they thought that was kind of cool, sort of defeating the system. Um, then. Uh, rule 16 uh, said the assertion density must be at least 2% over every module in the code. Why is that? So, so now first, uh, here's uh, the previous mission. Of course, it didn't have that rule, uh, didn't have a coding standard that was comparable to this. So it, it had a, an assertion density of 0 0.0 something, like basically just a few assertions in one of the modules. Um, didn't really count. The blue bar here is uh, the MSL code. So it had, we, at the end, we had 2.3% uh, assertion density. So that's the number of assertion statements. Uh, so for every 100 lines, for every 100 statements in the code, two of those 100 statements must be an assertion. And then the, the successor mission after that, which was uh, uh, SMAP, which is, another, uh, is an Earth orbiter that has since been launched. Uh, they got even better, so they uh, were developers from MSL that rolled off and that that's, uh, worked on that mission. They got to uh, about 3.5% uh, assertion density. This has proven its value over and over, it has saved our, our skin a number of occasions where the assertion will trip and uh, prevent some error from propagating. So uh, first mission at NASA, as far as I, I uh, know, where not only are assertions used at this level of density, but also the assertions are not turned off at launch. They remain active throughout the mission, including the landing sequence. So the most critical sequence where you can say, well, you're barreling down to the surface. If an assertion fails, you might as well continue. But no, we did not do that. So when the assertion fails, trip over to the other CPU. If another assertion fails at that point, you're toast. Right? And, and <laughs> should have tested better. So uh, why, why assertion density? There's this wonderful paper, paper written by two, uh, a number of Microsoft researchers, uh, three Microsoft researchers. Uh, one of them, them is, a, is a good friend of mine from, uh, used to work at Bell Labs Research, um, where they studied the, the correlation between fault density post-release fault density and assertion density in code. So as you know, Microsoft gets all these little reports like, oh, PowerPoint just crashed. Do you want to send a little report to Microsoft so that they can figure out what, what happened? So they get many of these reports. And it's fairly easy then to do a correlation and say, modules with high assertion density, do they have high or low post-release fault density? And the correlation is, is quite strong. So you can see, so this is the number of post-release faults per 1,000 lines of code, and this is the number of assertions in the code per 1,000 lines of code. And the correlation is clear, clear right? Few assertions per 1,000 lines of code, many faults post-release, many assertions per 1,000 lines of code, very few post-release faults. Um, the correlation is not true, true, that's true. Um, it's, a, it's a data item that we use in our certification courses. And uh, we help people you know, uh, take, the take the right uh, message. So 
doesn't exclude that there's a relation either. Right? So um, now, why, why would this help? So trying to explain uh, how this, this could work. If you have these assertions in your code, in every test that you run, these assertions do some self-checking, right? In hardware, we can use redundancy to improve reliability. Like Cassini, which is about to crash into Saturn tomorrow morning at 4 a.m., um, has two main engines. They only needed one of the main engines so far. But if that main engine would have failed, it would have ended the mission. It had been orbiting Saturn for the last uh, 14 years, I believe, or 13 years. Um, so if, if it's a mission ending, it's a critical thing, you, you, you can duplicate that, like multiple transmitters, multiple CPUs, multiple engines, etc. You cannot do that in software very easily, but what you can do is increase the redundancy of the software. Every software developer knows that the assertions are redundant, right? If, if, if they, do, they won't trip, because if they trip, you fix something. So every time you execute, they don't trip. That means they're redundant and you can remove them. And that's perfect, because that's the redundancy that you need to reproduce the effect of redundancy in hardware. So the most important thing is you never turn them off. Not in testing, not in any phase of testing, unit testing, integration testing, hardware in the loop testing, simulations, not in flight either. Okay, so, and, and it also means that when, when one of these self-checks doesn't pass, it tells you about it the earliest possible moment where this is detected. It doesn't just propagate where then, you know, five minutes later, something is horribly messed up and you have no idea how that happened. Okay, so that's the rule. And then you can say, why 2%? Um, we pick 2% because we, we had read papers that at Microsoft for the Microsoft Office code, the, the requirement was that the assertion density had to be 1% or higher. And we figured, well, we have to do, be better, right? This is a spacecraft, and it has to be better than Microsoft Office. <laughs> but you see people even exceed it. So uh, initially there was some skepticism, but now everybody's sold on this. We, we believe it. We've seen the effect. Um, and, and I can say, uh, I just mentioned, only 31, 31 rules for level of compliance 4. If we had to reduce that to 2, this would be a rule that I would keep, assertion density high, and the rule, the other rule of being able to compile without warnings in pedantic mode. Those two rules, I think, attribute for the largest part of, of increase in reliability. Third is, during code review, the developers have to respond to every single report, whether it's generated by a tool or by a human being. So, here is how that worked out. So this is after uh, about five, uh, 500,000 lines of code had been code reviewed. Of course, as you know, there were, there were about three million in total. Um, the yellow bar is, um, let me make sure, is, is peer uh, uh, reviewer comments. So human comments, somebody reading the code and saying, eh, I'm not so sure about this, this looks wrong. The blue bar is Warnings generated by static analyzers, and we used about five different static analyzers on this code every night. So you see the, the, the bars roughly have the same size, which is, I don't, that's a coincidence. That, that's no, no other uh, reason. Um, but also, this shows the, the, uh, how many of those reports or warnings led to a change in the code. So that's the most objective measure that I can think of, whether the warning is valid or not, because a developer when the warning is not valid, whether it's from a peer or from a tool, more likely when it's from a tool, over their dead body, right? They will not change the code. So in about 80% of the cases, the code was changed. So in about 20% of the, the reports, the code was not changed and it was overruled, saying, oh, this is a false positive, it's not valid, somebody doesn't understand the code, or the tool didn't understand it, or the peer didn't understand it. And it's roughly the same, the ratio is roughly the same for human-generated comments and for tool-generated comments. So the static analyzers were very effective, right? They were very helpful. And there are some other classifications that I, I gave there for when, how many times, you know, a, a, an objection from a developer saying, no, I don't want to fix that over my dead body, where in the code review, it was then determined by the, 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 the COGI, the, the software lead, saying, no, you should fix it anyway. 
Okay, uh, so those are our three small examples. So now I'll, I'll move to formal analysis. Um, so this is the part where you might start thinking like, how do I get out of this? And, you know. But okay, I'll, I'll show you just, I'll try to, to show you that it can be incredibly effective. And we were able to do this on, on this uh, flight code with very good effect. So uh, logic verification of some key multi-threaded uh, code fragments. So uh, where there's concurrency, and I mentioned there are 120 parallel threads of execution, so there's a lot of concurrency. So uh, we did verification of that by building models by hand that the logic model checker could accept. For instance, for dual boot, so there are two CPUs. When the, the, the spacecraft boots up, so it goes to sleep, you know, at regular intervals, even though, you know, it has RTGs, it doesn't technically need to go to sleep. But um, when it boots back up, there are two CPUs, CPUs that are booting up. Only one can be in charge of the spacecraft, right? So one is called prime and the other one is, is the, the standby system. Um, so how do you decide which one becomes prime and in, in control of the spacecraft? So there's an algorithm for that. It's partly in hardware. There's an arbitration algorithm. We modeled that, that algorithm and we found some, some sneak paths where it would be possible for both CPUs to declare prime or for neither one to declare prime, and both are bad, right? Both are scenarios that you don't want. So, uh, so that's, that's one example. Uh, second example, and I'll give a little bit more detail on this one, we did logic verification of uh, critical software subsystems, and specifically the subsystems for uh, the file system. File system main is maintained on, on flash hardware, so it's uh, a flash file system software. And, Flash hardware is bizarre. Right? It, it, it is very, very strange uh, how that works. So in my group, we developed uh, the, the prototype software for the, the, the file system management code. And then for the, the mission itself, uh, one member in my group developed uh, the, the actual flight software for the MSL mission. So we did verification on that using uh, model checking as well. So. Uh, What's the state of the art here? So it's always good to start with, okay, what can we expect to be able to do? Uh, I'll give one small example, which is a paper. So it's a paper published in 2000 uh, about a better way to implement a double-sided queue with uh, a, a DCAS operation. It's a, a double word compare and swap instruction. So it's to increase performance, you don't want to use semaphores or locks. You do this compare and swap operation. And this is a double word compare and swap. So here, these authors, and it's a whole uh, list of authors, publish this paper and say, here's an algorithm for doing that safely. You have concurrent access to this double-sided queue. You can push things in the left and push things in the right, pop them from the left and pop them from the right, all concurrently with multiple readers and writers. So um, there's a manual proof. It's just a standard classic proof written down very carefully, reviewed by the referees and then approved for publication. It's about five pages of a proof, seven lemmas and five theorems. And it uh, took them a few months to do this and, and to go through the publication cycle. Of course, that takes uh, a couple of months as well. So uh, the proof looked like it could be mechanized. So uh, a university in Australia gave a graduate student the task of mechanizing that proof using a theorem prover. And they, they picked the PVS theorem prover as one of the standard theorem provers. He worked on that for about three months and concluded that he couldn't prove it. And uh, after discussion with the authors and, and with the, the maintainers of PVS, they discovered that they couldn't prove it because the original proof in that first paper was wrong. And not only that, the algorithm was wrong. So. Together, they came up with a new version of the code. And now, in this case, not with a handwritten proof, but with a mechanical proof. Uh, when Leslie Lampert uh, heard about this, he said, oh, I can do this better in, in my system, in, in uh, PlusCal, with, with uh, the uh, theorem prover behind it. And so he did the same proof, and he, he spent a couple of days, but these are Leslie Lampert days, right? So these are not you know, human mortal uh, days. So my question is, so that about 11 years later, 
can we do this any faster today? So if we could do it like if we went from a couple of months to a couple of days, surely by now it's a couple of hours or minutes. And then the sobering answer is, no, it's not. It's still, if you're not Leslie Lambert, it's a couple of months. And if you are Leslie Lambert, it's a couple of days. And that's not good enough, right? Because uh, if it's a couple of months, not being Leslie Lampert, um, the software will have changed. So I will have proven a version of the code that is three months old now. And I have to start over with the new version. And again, I'll be behind. So I want something that takes a couple of hours, maybe, but really minutes or seconds. That's, I'll settle for minutes or seconds. So how can you do that? So here's the algorithm. Here's first the semantics of the DCAS operation written as a C function that's supposed to execute atomically. Of course, in reality, it won't. But you know, to give the semantics, that's roughly uh, what it will do. And in, in my system, I can make sure that that particular function will execute atomically in a, in a concurrent setting. And here are two of the, the functions for, in this case, for, for handling uh, the right side of the queue, pushing something on the right side of the queue and popping something from the queue from the right side again. And uh, there are two more for push left and push uh, pop left. So that's the C code, exactly the way it was shown in the article. So then um, I can create a test harness where I just build a sample reader and a sample writer. And of course, ultimately, I can do multiple copies of the readers and the writers and say so the writer will simply push on the right side. In this case, it's just a test case. A number from 0 to 10, from yeah, 0 to 10. Uh, make sure that, that they were appended correctly, because you know, the return value can be, I couldn't do it. Um, push in uh, 10 values, and the, the reader will try to read them back out concurrently. And it better get the same values out. So then. Um, put an assertion in to make sure you know, that the right values come out. So uh, I add, to make the whole thing closed and self-contained, I write a little heap allocator to make sure I don't need to use a library malloc that I don't know how, how it functions. So I just use uh, a heap in, in core as an array and a little allocator that uh, I can compile with the code. So I have a standalone executable that I can analyze. So it's about 200 lines. It's just taken from the paper, right? Typed in because they gave C code, so it's just typed in from the paper. Just like the other people did, like the, the, the ones doing the manual proof and the theorem uh, proof, or, uh, proof. So now, at this point, what I want to do, and I don't want it to get more complicated than this, I just want to be able to say, verify this. So verify dcast.c, which is the code that I showed, just showed you. I showed you half of the code. The push right and pop right, and, and push left and pop right is just symmetrical, but on the other side. So that's what I want to do. And then I want that to run very quickly, like not three months. So I can. Now the question is, how does this work? So what's, there's a lot going on behind the scene. So first. Um, the whole process here is about 10 seconds. Whatever the magic is, is about 10 seconds of work. And then the verification is less than a second, which is great. It's not always like that, but in this case, it came out like that. Um, so what happens in those 10 seconds? What happens in those 10 seconds is there's a model extractor that reads the C code as a C parser and builds a model from that code with a little bit of guidance from me. And compiles that code, runs the model checker over the code, and finds a path to the assertion violation, reports it. And that step is very quick in this case. If, if the code gets a lot more complicated, or if you have more readers and writers, or you start to do 100 elements into the queue, then you know, time will go up. So what's that little bit of magic? So first here, that's the code. It's about 200 lines, and including the little heap allocator and the semantics description of DCAS itself. And there's the little bit of magic, the key to making this work, which is nine lines. So how bad can that be, right? So I'm asking you to write nine lines. And, and OK, maybe uh, yeah, it's not going to take you three months to write nine lines of code. 
at actually not even for the MSL software, right? There was about seven lines in an hour. Worst case, it's about an hour. So that's a file that I add called dcas.prx, is that file. And I'll show you what's in that file. That's the contents of that file. And the contents of the file says, I'm interested in push write and pop write. Extract a model for those two C functions. Not changing the C functions at all. There's no subset of C here. It's full C, can have pointers, can do every ugly thing. Those two, my initialization code, which I, oops, uh, my initialization code, which I also wrote in C, the sample reader and the sample writer from the test harness. And then I say include you know, this header file which defines the data structures. That's it. And then uh, give that to the model extractor. So um, let's see. Right. So that's it. Right. So works in this case. And, and like I said, sometimes when the code is a lot more complex, but this is already code where people spend months proving it correct. To find the flaw in a few seconds with this particular approach. If it's a more complicated algorithm, you may have to spend a little bit more time trying to tease out the, the, the way to verify it efficiently. So the, 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 obviously the next question is what if it's bigger, right? So what if it's this flash file system which can store millions of files uh, on the rover and really, really has to be robust. So. Um, Standard method is, of course, to do unit testing, uh, integration testing, random simulation, and all those things. So here, here's sort of the steps that you can go through to build a test harness for this code. So it's, uh, I think it was about six or 7,000 lines of C code in this case. So not 200 lines, but six or 7,000 lines. And pretty subtle code developed over a period of about two years. So first, you see the random number generator. Uh, you initialize format and mount the file system. Then pick a random number and say, I'm going to create that number of files in the file system, anything between 0 and n. I'm going to do this repeatedly, right? Create a bunch of files. Um, and you pick n carefully to be near the maximum number of files per directory. So there are directories and files. It's a Unix, it's a POSIX file system that we fly on this, this mission. So you pick it near that border where something funky could be happening. Then you add a random number of bytes to, to a randomly selected file. With M, the number of bytes, again, the maximum number near or slightly over one page on the flash. So there are blocks and pages on flash hardware. I don't bother you with the ugliness of, of how flash hardware uh, works, but um, you, you pick something near a boundary where strange things might be happening. Like you just are bigger than a page, just shorter than a page, etc. Then you randomly delete or move files. Randomly mine, unmount and remount the file system. And uh, then you check so you do all these things, and then you check an invariant, the, that the integrity of the POSIX file system is preserved after all of this randomly happening. How you do that, I'll, I'll show in a second. And then rinse and repeat. Do this over and over and over and over and over until launch, and even after launch, right? You keep doing this. Um, so how do you do that? How do you, how do you make that a little more rigorously? So if you do this truly randomly, you may end up doing the same thing over and over, right? and you would never know it. You happen to pick the same number of files, same number of bytes, et cetera. You have no way of knowing that. So to make this more powerful and more rigorous, you want to do a number of things. First, you want to do many, many, many of these tests in parallel, as many as you have CPUs laying around. Then you create a deliberately small file system. So there's no point in having the full file system because Stuff happens at the boundaries. So if you put those boundaries closer to where it's easier to get to the boundaries, you will discover the same problems. So we have a file system with eight blocks instead of the real system, which has 256 blocks. We have four pages per block instead of 64 pages per block. We have 116 bytes per page. Don't ask me why that number, but there was a good reason for it. Instead of uh, 8K. And um, we have 
only about uh, 3K of data in the file system instead of 128 megabytes, which is in the real flash file system on Mars. So then we want to avoid redundancy, like doing things over and over because of the randomness, right? The random number generator will just, you know, happily forget what it did before because it's a random number generator. So we add state capture. So every state of the system under test, we're going to remember. And if we recreate that same state at some later point in the test, we're going to say, don't need to do that. We've done that before. Back out, try something different. So we remember each state seen in the search. So you, you get this search tree, and every node in the search tree is going to be remembered with a hash. So you create a 64-bit hash, store it away. If you match that 64-bit hash sometime later, you say, probably seen that before. Don't do that again. Try something else. And then we add backtracking. So um, we explore this, the system behavior going down the execution tree. And if we say, well, we've seen that before, you back out, you, you undo an operation and try something else. So being able to go forwards and backwards in an execution is incredibly important. Like to be able to back out is just a member of resetting the previous state. So since we're remembering all states on a search stack, you can undo it by just copying back the, the pre-state. And you can keep doing that, coming back to the initial state if you need to. So you never do anything more than once. And that makes it very, very powerful and, and efficient. So um, the model checker can take care of the details. So basically, everything I told you about is something the model checker already does. It knows how to remember states. It knows how to do backtracking, how to do reverse operations uh, on models extracted from C code. So we take the, the, the actual C code. All we put in front is a driver where we say, randomly pick an operation, say, uh, uh, Create, uh, create a file, open a file, uh, do a remount, etc. cetera. Um, then we say, well, track certain data. So what determines what the state of the system is? Define these things like these data structures hold state, and we want to be able to undo the effect of certain operations on that part of the state. And then you have a configuration file that way you can randomly, again, select which operations you will enable in a test or not. So you do this. Massively parallel, all these things configured randomly, differently, and do a very efficient search, never repeating any test uh, because it, it's going to remember. So this is how it works out. So here we have the selection of a POSIX operation. So it's POSIX compliant. So MUKDER, RUMDER, open, uh, rewrite, write, unlink, reboot. Uh, the hardest operation to get right was move or rename uh, because in a move operation, uh, there are multiple states that, that have to follow each other in a particular order. Uh, you you want to avoid that due to uh, um, a software bug, you lose the file when you try to move it. Like you remove it from the source and it never appears at the destination. Or you get two copies where you, you, you create it at the destination and the old copy still uh, exists, uh, et cetera. Um, so now what I didn't mention that we wanted this whole thing to be resilient to sudden loss of power. So the file system has to preserve its integrity even if in the middle of an operation like this, you lose power. So suddenly somebody pulls the plug. Now you can't do that with your, your home PC, right? If you boot back up, you, you may be in for a surprise. You can't do it on, on this file system uh, on Mars and because we can't guarantee, like you know, the, the little Martian can walk up to the rover and hit reboot, right? And we want our file system to be intact so that we can take a picture of the little alien. So um, that's a driver, and this is actually the language, the specification language of the model checker that says make a non-deterministic selection of an operation like this, where, where the operation itself is executed as C code. Right? It's the actual C code, not a model of the C code. It's the actual C code function. So SPIN then does this parallel search. In our case, we settled for 64 uh, cores, uh, the 64 core system that was just 24 hours busy doing this uh, for doing the parallel search. Linked to the source code, unmodified MSL source code, calling functions in that source code. And then, you know, after every operation, we want to check these invariants that the integrity of the file system 
even when power was lost and, and restored and file system unmounted and remounted, that the integrity of the invariance was ma maintained. So how do you do that? Well, we have the POSIX standard that says what is supposed to happen or what is allowed to happen. So we have an Oracle, which was a trusted, trusted reference system. And actually, it took us a while to find a reference system we could trust. So we tried a number of different systems, implementations of file systems on, on Macs, on Linux systems, on Windows systems. Turns out many of them are not really very good. Um, but we found one. Actually, the one that we, that we eventually used was the uh, one that we wrote ourselves, which is truly a very simple, not for flash hardware, but just a RAM file system that's really fully compliant with the POSIX standard, but also fairly small, so easy to check in other ways. And so we run every operation, so SPIN runs every operation twice, one on the code that we're testing, and once on our reference system, and then it checks that both reach the same state. Now, if there's a power loss in the middle of an operation, the state af after the operation should be for, for the the file system on the, the spacecraft should either be the pre-state or the post-state. Right? It cannot be anything other than that. Either the operation didn't happen at all or the operation completed. And, and as I mentioned, the hardest operation, POSIX operation for that to get that to work right is move because you know, it has to disappear in one place and appear in another place. We didn't use journaling for, for this. So um, check the invariance. And if there's any discrepancy, then it's either our reference system has the problem. So initially, we found cases of that. And after some point when this is rock solid, then it's in this code. So we ran that test nonstop, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, every time a change was made in the flight code, we updated the system. And usually, if a bug was introduced, which happens more often than it should, this would find it like instantly. Like within a few seconds, it would find it. Um, so after a system like that runs for a day and it doesn't report anything, you, you get probably like inappropriate, some confidence that it's probably OK. So that's, that's how that works. So how we introduced formal analysis in checking um, the, the rover code so for, for the rover. And that is the code that runs on the rover. So, uh, Oh, yeah, one, one really important thing. So there's the concrete state of the flight code, which has a lot of data, even with the small version of the file system. We have an abstraction function that says abstract that and store it as an abstract state. Could be, for instance, a 64-bit or a 128-bit hash. So that doesn't have all the detail. But we use that to guide the search to determine we've been there before. Don't do that test again and, and back up. So that, that's, that's the overview of how that works. So um, this is roughly the profile of the mission. So the, the vertical scale is, is exaggerated a little. We're climbing up Mount Sharp. Uh, this is where we landed in Yellowknife Bay. And over the last um, five years since landing, it's almost exactly five years. So an Earth year is not the same as a Mars year, because a Martian day is slightly longer than uh, an Earth day. But it's roughly five years. Uh, we've been climbing up this hill and doing lots of science, taking samples, and trying to figure out if conditions could have been right on Mars for, um, um, for life to exist. And basically, that question could be answered after a few months on the surface of Mars. Uh, uh, in a positive way. Uh, yes, conditions could, all the elements were available. The next mission is going to dig a little deeper to figure out uh, uh, what, what's going on with there. So now for the software, we've landed a number, starting with the Viking rovers and uh, the Pathfinder rover in 1997 uh, and the uh, MER rovers, the Mars Exploration rovers in uh, 2003. Uh, we've landed a number of spacecraft on, on Mars. Uh, so we can compare with the previous mission. The previous mission was the Mir Exploration Rovers. One of them is still working. They were designed to work for about three months. And one of them is still working like 14 years later. And so some people think, well, uh, that, that's wrong, right? That's over-designed. But we think it's kind of cool. Um, so the previous mission where none of these rules were followed, 
uh, first year of operation on the surface of Mars, where 26 days, so about a month of time, was lost for science uh, due to software problems. For this mission, which has about five times more code, instead of 600,000 lines of code, we are flying three million lines of code, much more complex code. We lost only one day to a single software bug in the first year of operation. And since then, we found two or three other bugs. So really a, a huge, huge difference that, of course, everybody who worked on this mission can say, well, that was me, like I did. And so I can say, well, that was me. <laughs> that was the coding standard, the rules we followed, the code review process, certification process, all these things combined lead to more reliable code. So one more picture to show you, uh, then I'll end the talk. And so this picture really sums up the technology of a mission like this. Uh, this picture, I think, is the most awesome picture you've ever seen in your life. And now, you know, I, I, I'm not shy in exaggerating, but in this case, you really look at this picture, what you're looking at is a valley, and there are tire tracks starting in the middle of that valley, and something is driving away. And by the way, this is on a different planet. So something came there, landed there from somewhere else, and drove away on Mars, on the surface of Mars. Now, if that's not astonishing, if that's not like, wow, that's what, what we can do, uh, then, then nothing probably gets close. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Gerard, for a very interesting talk. Um, we're going to open up to Q&A. We have a, a custom that we give our first question to our co-sponsor. It will have nothing to do with your talk, okay. by the way. How much did the mission cost? <laughs> uh, no, not quite, but close. Um, so I'd like to see by a show of hands how many of you are IEEE members. Uh, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10, 15 or so. Okay, thank you. <laughs> the reason we do this is we, he gets funding based on the number of IEEE members here. So with that done, let's open it up to questions about Gerard's talk. So show of hands. Mike? Yeah, I'm curious if you use formal logic for some of the uh, verification because, I mean, you didn't mention formal logic at all, but uh, I was wondering. Yes, uh, so the logic model checker uses temporal logic. So it's linear temporal logic as you know, introduced by Amir Brunelli in 1997. Um, and so there's this, this model checking procedure where you can take an LTL formula, uh, translate it into an omega automaton, and then do the model checking procedure with a nested depth first search. So it's basically a graph search. But yes, everything is specified as a logic formula. Yeah? Great. I'll bring the microphone over to you. Now, of course, you knew when you started the, the launch date. That had to be fixed. So you had a deadline. Yes. So you couldn't just say, we're going to make it perfect. You had to, you had to finish it by a particular date. How did that all work out? Excellent question. Um, so development started in 2007, 2008. And our deadline was a launch in uh, um, 2009. Um, now, because of the mechanics, the orbital mechanics, you can only launch once every two years, roughly. Uh, so if you miss that launch window, you have to wait two years. We launched in 2011. We did miss the launch window, and we had to wait two years. Now, it wasn't the software, although people on the software team we're concerned, like, oh, I hope nobody thinks it's the software. It was hardware components uh, that, that could not be delivered at the right level of accuracy. And at some point, they ran out of time. They couldn't fix it. Uh, so they had to just slip the launch window. So the flight software team scaled down for a, for a while, for about half a year. And then we resumed. And it gave us a chance to really rethink the process and fix a lot more things than otherwise probably we could have fixed. But also, we ended up with more code than otherwise. If we would have launched uh, at the original launch date, 
the amount of code would have been like, you know, less than two and a half million lines. But yeah, give us more time and we write more code. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I just have a question regarding object-oriented programming in general um, can sort of get decentralized over time. I was just curious how long the main was for your uh, code that you executed till the end of the river. Well, so um, I'll, I'll try to answer. If I misinterpret your question, you know, let me know. Uh, so this runs on a VxWorks operating system. And it means so that there are tasks, there are real-time tasks. And so the operating system will initiate tasks. So there's not a main routine that will fork off you know, a number of threads. Uh, the operating system will initiate tasks. And they're, they're, they, run, they run, right? They, 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 they don't come to life and die and get recreated. It's a static uh, set of tasks that are running. So including during landing. So during landing, only some of the tasks are relevant. Uh, so you, you're not using the file system or the imaging system or anything like that. But all those tasks keep running. Um, so they, they, on boot, those tasks are created and they start running and they wait for the message. So then inter-process communication or inter-task communication is, is uh, with messages and a little bit of shared memory. Yeah. So given that some of your quality metrics are essentially static um, you know, compiler warnings and things like that, would it not in some future more perfect version of this make sense to have better support in the language itself for dynamic aspects? So for example, software transactional memory for threading and garbage collection or somehow handling you know, memory errors. And you know, g going with that, how would you actually handle a memory error? And you know, does it make sense to just have two systems running Valgrind in parallel? And if one fails Valgrind, then the other one works. Well, we, we used Valgrind during uh, development and, and unit testing and et cetera. Um, we use uh, uh, error correction in the memory. And so, so actually the environment on Mars and in space is kind of brutal. So there's their cosmic radiation causes pit flips. So it's, uh, there's a, a scrubber that runs through memory nonstop, like reading and writing memory. So correcting uh, single bit errors and it'll report uh, uncorrectable double bit errors, uh, which, which happens rarely. But when it happens, then we know. And then, then that, that uh, I guess we do a reboot to make sure the memory is correct. Um, Garbage collection is, is, is no good because that's uh, unpredictable for performance. You get a performance hit, suddenly you can't. For, for, for some operations you can, but uh, like if you're just driving around on the surface, I guess uh, that would be no problem, but uh, that, that's not used. Uh, and actually there's no dynamic memory allocation at all. It's one of those categories that we found uh, causing problems in flight is the use of dynamic memory, like still using a freed segment of memory or failing to free something, memory leaks and all these things, stepping on bad pointers. So there's, there's no dynamic memory allocation at all, so we don't need a garbage collector because there is no garbage. Every module and every task gets a statically allocated amount of memory and it has to live within those means. Uh, better languages, safer languages, yeah, absolutely. Uh, problem is there's this heritage that if flight software team has a number of these successes, so they're the victim of their own success. Uh, starting in 1997, uh, flight software for, for these spacecraft started being written in C. Now, for instance, Cassini, the mission orbiting Saturn, that'll crash into Saturn tomorrow morning at 4 a.m., uh, is, is a mission where the code was written in ADA. Uh, that was launched uh, in 1997, got to Saturn, in 2003 and has been orbiting since then and now it's running out of fuel. So that's the only mission that we have where the, sh the code was written in ADA and apparently I wasn't at JPL at the time yet but they had a hard time finding people who, who could write ADA code or, and understand it and do it reasonably well. Um, once in a while people will propose switching to C++ and of course there are lots of people that propose switching to, you know, any other language under the sun, including uh, Scala or anything you want. 
um, but there's no tradition, there's no heritage, there's no existing skill base. Uh, the tools are not as robust uh, in some cases. So that, that will be a, a challenge to do a switch, especially because, you know, once, once we start losing missions, <laughs> just maybe there's a better case that can be made, but this seems to be working really well. Plus, most safety critical software is written in C because it's a simpler language, easier to understand. Uh, we all make mistakes. The mistakes that you make in C code are a little easier to catch and easier to understand. Yeah. We're going to take two more questions. I think we've got one in the back and I think one over here. And then we'll break. And if you have one-on-one -on -one questions, you can probably come up and sure. uh, talk to uh, Dr. Holtzman afterwards. So, uh, Alan, you had one in the back here? Or Thanks don't. for an excellent talk. Uh, very enjoyable. So uh, I'm curious about the few bugs that you did discover in flight. Uh, do, do you have a, uh, a, a kind of smoking gun analysis of the, the rules that were violated or, or kind of rules you would add, the, the gaps? Yes. Um, no rules were violated. Uh, the bug in the first year that cost us one day was a bug in the file system, something that we missed, uh, that our test system should have caught, but we hadn't configured it in that way. And the bug is fascinating, and I, I wish I could write a paper on it, but there are too many details. So uh, flight software is classified ITAR. As, as you know, you can't talk about it, can't see it, can't, you know, can't smell it. Uh, but the bug is so fascinating how, so it required, let's see, how did that happen? It required creation of a file of a particular size, related to page size and all that, then shutting down the system, bringing the system to sleep, coming back up and mounting the file system, making one change or creating an extra file of a smaller size, then again shutting down, mounting back, and then moving that file, and that exposed the bug. And so this is so bizarre, like who thinks of that? And, and of course the answer is this model checker can think of that path, right? But we hadn't, we hadn't the frequency of mounts and remounts wasn't sufficient in our test system that that came up. Uh, so yeah, it, it was a learning experience for us, like, yes. So after you do all this testing and even this type of analysis, the stuff that remains is really, really bizarre, like it's really low probability. Like if we would have discovered this before flight, we would have said that's never going to happen, right? So forget it, don't, don't fix it. But yes. Um. I should preface my question by saying that I'm not a software developer, coder, really. But I have a general interest question. I've heard it said that no modern software could possibly be tested through every possible state it could get into. You've done a good job of keeping from retesting a state you've already tested. What fraction of the possible states do you think you are testing? Excellent question. A, a small fraction. Um, but the key the key issue is that fraction that we're testing is phenomenally larger than what you can do with standard unit and integration testing. So we do better by a very large, by a few orders of magnitude. Actually, I did try to figure that out. How much more thorough is this? So yes, we're still scratching the surface. We're doing a few orders of magnitude better. We're looking at many more scenarios than a traditional approach does. So yeah, yeah, we we're not perfect, but <laughs> perfection is is not really. It's a good goal, but I don't think for a system like this, this approach will get you there. You would need to model and abstract, and do what a mathematician does: is to make capture the essence of what the system does, and and prove something about that. Okay, with that, um, we'd like to thank uh, Gerard. We have a couple of gifts for him, one a certificate of appreciation. So thank you for coming down, and thank you for making the drive from Monrovia or wherever you live all the way down here in traffic today. And then the, uh, the second uh, gift is a token, personal token 
of appreciation. It's a bottle of limoncello that I handmade. Oh, wow. And I don't know if you drink or like this stuff, but if you don't, I'm sure you have a friend. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome.